As God, I'm excited about today's topic um, on the specific will of God. Last week we talked a little bit more about God's general will, and today we're going to get right into God's specific will. But I'm going to kind of go over uh, some of the points that I wasn't able to really elaborate on um, you last week. And I wanted to bring this sheet of paper in right here because this is all new material from 3 a.m. this morning. So I ain't had time to type it. I scribble. So it's a lot of stuff that I'm going to try, try to really, because this guy gave me this this morning. And I'm like, man, you're doing every 3 a.m. all the time, Lord? I'm like, come on now. Now I mess with you. But he can do whatever he wants. But uh, <clears throat> so some of these points may be sporadic, but I'm going to follow a skeleton and uh, make sure that you guys don't be confused in the process. So turn me your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Verses 1 through 2, we're going to do like a little recap of what we've been talking about the last two weeks. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It is very important for us to know God's specific will. There's a quote that I've heard so many times that the will of God will not take you where his grace won't keep you. Many people are derelict from God's will, therefore they don't really tap into the full abundance of grace that God wants to specifically give them for a specific assignment. <clears throat> so turn me to Romans chapter 12, and I'm going to get into that a little bit more. And thank you so much, everyone's watching on YouTube, man. Thank you guys for watching. If you want to follow along with these great men and women, you can go ahead and go to the description box in the video, click the link, and you'll be able to download the worksheet that everybody's uh, engaging with me with. So go ahead and pause the video and follow along with us. But for those in the room, let's turn to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. And also, those on YouTube, definitely let me know where you guys are watching from. I love seeing where you guys are viewing from. The Bible says, I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is just reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing, that by testing, <clears throat> excuse me, you may discern what is the will of God? What is good and acceptable and perfect? Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for who you are, God. I appreciate you giving me this great opportunity to be able to pour out what you poured into me to these great men and women. I pray, Father God, your hearts are intact, no holes, nothing for this word to leak out. And I pray, Father God, let this word sink deep inside their hearts to the point that it urges them day in and day out to apply. Father God, you have a specific will for us. Father God, you desire for us to know it. And God, I pray I do your word justice, Father God, for I know I'm inadequate. I cannot even do it as best as I can for you because you're perfect. But God, I still count it an honor that you give me this opportunity to pour out what you poured in. And Father God, if you're not in this room, man, I, I'm begging you, please be with us today. Because if you're not, I'm wasting these great people's time. With that being said, God, we thank you. As you know, we pray. <clears throat> Amen. There are four things that you and I need to know or to make sure that we know how to discern. It's evident in Romans chapter 12, verses 2. It says, if you look at your uh, sheet, it says that by testing, you may discern what is, number one, the will of God, number two, what is good, number three, what is acceptable, and number four, what is perfect. For the next three, four, to five, maybe six, depending on you guys' um, hunger, will determine how long I will go. But for the next few weeks, I'm going to be discussing the top four things you and I need to discern. Right now, we're covering the first one, which is, what is the will of God? Let's go to our notes. The first part of your notes, I filled in the blanks for you already, because we kind of covered most of these notes since last week. But I kind of got some new information from God this morning. I want to elaborate on these points some more. The problem is, for your first point, is many of us are unaware of what the will of God is for our lives. Number two, the cause of this problem is due to us either not having the desire to know his will, or due to the overwhelming confusion that surrounds this topic. The problem in our culture is that many of us are unaware of what God's will is for us. The number one question you should answer, or should have an answer for, is why are you here? Do you even know what your purpose is? Do you even know why you exist? <clears throat> because package inside each and every one of you is your purpose. The sad thing about us is that we have allowed our lives to hoard so many experiences, and hoard all these many of thoughts that's compounding itself on top of what's deep rooted in us, which is our purpose. The will of God equals God's intent. What God intends for you to do. He has intentions. Before you was in your mother's womb, what did he say? No, he knew you. That he formed you. He fashioned you. That before you was even an embryo, before you was even had eyes and legs or fingers in your mother's womb, 
father's womb. He said, before you was even thought of, before your parents was even thought of, I knew you. That's power in that. Why do you think our culture is so caught up in the evolutionary type of thoughts? Because they know if I can get you to believe that you came from nothing, then you want to amount to nothing. But if you know for a fact that you were created, formed, fashioned, specifically placed, then you will live a life knowing that I'm here for a reason. The sad thing in our culture is many people are completely unaware of what the will of God is for their life. The will of God equals God's intentions for you, what he intended for you to do. And many people lose sight of that because they're caught up in their own intents. They want to be the God of their own lives. But they fail to realize that God has ways is higher than ours. His thoughts are higher than ours. That he already has a plan for you far beyond what you can ever grasp on your own. But that chair you're sitting in, the creator intended for that chair, the inventor of that chair created that chair with the intent of it holding you. But when a person uses the chair outside of its original intent, that chair is now being abused. Abused by definition, those who have been walking me for a while, is abnormal use. When you do not know the accurate will for you, if you don't know what God wants you to be, or grasp what he wants you or desires for you or intends for you to do, you will misuse your life, and once you misuse it, you'll abuse it. Are you abnormally using it? Are you even taking the necessary amount of time to find out God? Why am I here? What is your intent for me? Now, many people get sad. Like, Man, what if I had not done what God intended for me to do? See, God knows his grace is so sufficient, meaning that even if you did not pass the test in your past, his grace is sufficient to redeem the time. That I don't have to wallow in my <clears throat> procrastination, in my pity that leads me to procrastination because I feel like, well, I haven't even done anything close to what God wants me to do. But I'm glad that Jesus did what he was intended to do. To give me an opportunity to say, you know what? I may have gotten it wrong. I may not have done what you have intended for me to do, Father. But from this moment on, I'm going to do what you now intend for me to do. Are you willing to become aware of God's will for you? Because that chair is created with the intent to hold you. And you were created with the intent to create you know him as your creator, you understand what creativity is. If you understand what creativity is, you would, let, you would do what it takes for the necessary time to create. Are you allowing different things to keep you from knowing what God's will is for you? Now, people say, Josh, God's will? That's a, that's a big thing. What's God's will for me? Now, I'm telling you right now, God has a specific will for you to do. That Should that burden you? No. That should let you know that despite what I do know, despite what I don't know, I'm still going to be close enough to God to find out in due season. Number two, the cause of this problem is due to us either not having the desire to know his will or due to the overwhelming confusion that surrounds this topic. From my notes this morning, we're going to talk about the process of defilement and the process of fulfillment. The cause of this problem is due to us either not having the desire to know his will or due to the overwhelming confusion that surrounds the topic. Let's talk about that for a minute. Desire is a powerful thing. Each and every one of you have a desire. I have a desire to be one of the greatest spokesmen in history. I'm not trying to be second best, third best. I told God... I want to be the best to do it since you did. Now, that's a big statement. Because there was a guy named Paul. <clears throat> there was some other jokes that walked with him. There have been some great vocal pieces. But I said, at least if I shoot for the stars, I'll fall into the clouds. Because I say, God, if your word says that I can do exploits, if your word says that great works I should, I'm actually going to believe your word for what it says. So if I'm <clears throat> crazy enough to believe that I can do greater than Jesus, then why not have a mentality to say, this is my desire, is to be the greatest person I can be. My greatest desire is to make sure that I, when I get to heaven, that God says, well done. That when I cross that pearly gate, that God's arms are wide open saying, Josh, you made the best use of the time. If your desire will determine your direction. But the Bible says, they that delight themselves in the what? Lord, he'll give you what? The desires of your heart. Many people look at that scripture, they kind of misquote it. They say, well, shoot, if I, if I do 
the basic rules of Christianity, if I do the bare minimum, then you're obligated to give me my desires. That's not what the text is saying. The text is saying, if you delight in me and become one in me, your desires will eventually be my desires. Whoever or whomever you delight in has your desires by the neck. Who do you desire? Who do you delight in? Delight and delight. Whoever I delight in lights me up. If, 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 if money is my desire, it's not money, because money is a means to an end. If success is my delight, if, if money is my delight, if, if relationship is my delight, if marriage is my delight, if that's my ultimate goal, that if I don't have this thing, I am nothing, then anything that I put before God and I say, this is what's going to light me up, will determine my desires. And desire is such a passionate and powerful thing that if it's not controlled, if it's not guarded, it will lure you down a path that you will actually regret. Let's talk about these points real quick. Desire. Let's talk about that for a minute. Let me get into my scribbles. My scribbles right here. I kind of made it clear on this sheet. But um, <clears throat> the cause of this problem is that many of us either, not, either do not have a desire to know his will or due to the overwhelming confusion that surrounds him. The process of the vow, the foul, let's talk about that. This system designed by Satan is engineered for you and myself to have perverted desires. Desire is not bad. People think that, man, I can not have no desire for anything. The old shit, I can't have a desire to be successful. Oh, man, I can't. Well, so, no, but the Bible says be very careful that your desires don't become per uh, perverted. But your desires have to be pure at heart. That if my desire is to be successful, I have to make sure that my desire is first in sync with the one who gave me the desire. So the objective of this culture is to defile our desire. So number one, the process of defilement is to dilute your desire. Number two, defile your desire. And number three, redirect your desires. This is not only a worksheet. It's just raining from 3 a.m. <laughs> So I printed these the day before, so I was like, I ain't gonna waste this piece of paper. Uh, and, uh, the process of the foul. To dilute your desires, to di defile your desires, and to redirect. Let's talk about that. Many of us are unaware of just how powerful a desire is. The ultimate objective of the system is to defile that desire. If that defile, dilute. When you dilute something, see me, I'm old school. Man. When I was a kid, man, I ain't like soda, man. Like, I'm the type of kid that, you know, I pinch it so a little bit and I shake it up and a little fizz come up. Y'all see, y'all don't know about that. Y'all just like that hard stuff. Y'all used to like all the pop all the, all the But I used to shake the soda because I didn't like soda as potency. I liked it flat. So what happens is the more that you put water into something, it dilutes the potency of something else. That the objective is that the desire in your heart, their goal is how can we flood inside of your soul of counterfeits, of conforming things, lustful things to dilute you having a desire to know God's will. The ultimate objective is not only should I direct you from God's will, I want to make sure you have no desire for it in the first place. That right now, I don't care if you're a preacher, I don't care if you go to church, I don't care what you do. That doesn't mean you have authentic desires for God. That doesn't mean that you love him. It means that you care more about what he gives more than who he is. So what happens is your desire, you have to decipher, is it genuine? That right now, I only know my true desires for what I do. For all you know, I can be doing this for the money. I could be doing this for my own name. I could be posting quotes just to get a bunch of likes. You don't know, only God knows my genuine desire. That's why you got to make it your objective to say, God, show me if my, if my desires are diluted. Is my desire weak? Is my desire nothing but a burst of flames? Or is my desire steady? Because if you don't delight in him, your desires will become diluted. Peter got off the boat. Jesus out there in the water going to the other side, right? And Peter was like, there go Jesus, y'all talk to the boys in the boat. Now he's like, oh, that's Jesus, y'all. He got so excited in the beginning that he said, Jesus, if you bid me to come, I'll go. Jesus said, hey, yo, come on out, bro. Peter stepped off the boat and he was walking on 
on what was supposed to drown him. He walked on what was supposed to drown him because his eyes were fixed. The moment you waver your eyes away from your life and in him, slowly over time, your desires will come down with it. You remember when you first read the word when you was that zeal? That's why I tell young brothers that that's what advice about ministry. I said, oh, you're excited now, my man. You got a lot of zeal in the tank. They talking about, oh, we're going to take over this whole south region. This region's going to be out. We're going to take this city. Gonna... I said, oh, look at that city. That zeal is so cute. <laughs> that zeal is so, it's such a beautiful thing. I'm 30 years old. I had that same zeal when I was 19 in my dorm room. I said, I started just talking to Prince of Cali for one hour open. Just mean one. I said, I have authority. And God said, your zeal and your faith is two totally different things. You think your zeal is your faith. You think that since I'm excited about God, I have faith in God. Your excitement doesn't correlate with your faith. Your faith is proven and developed over time. Faith is a muscle. Excitement is an expression. If your faith is developed like a muscle, your faith becomes strong over time. It's these young pups, I call it. But the only zeal. Say, I'm going to get off this boat and I'm going to do the miraculous. And the devil said, bring me the storm. In the wind, bring in the waves, bring in the shark little fin coming through the water, and let's see if we can get these different persuasions to get their eyes off who they originally delight in. It doesn't mean that most people truly don't delight in you. I believe people have good intent with God, but many of us don't know enough of God to stay with Him. Because if we took the time to say, you know what, God, show me my desire, keep my eyes fixed on you, <clears throat> because. He didn't walk on the water when the storm was not there. He walked on the water in the midst of the storm. That means no matter what you're going through, you can still walk on it, even in the midst of it. But the, 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 the principle to this equation is your eyes have to be fixed on him. He has to be the joy of your life. That's why the Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. That there is tangible strength that comes with having joy in him. See, people are happy. I don't like happiness. Happiness is based upon conditions. That if I don't, if I don't have this or that, I'm unhappy. Joy says, if, even if I don't have it, I still have joy. That's why the Bible says what? Count it all joy when you go through how many various amount of trials. Knowing that by the testing of this, by the testing of your faith produces patience. Remember, remember the word now. Thank you, thank you. So the problem in our culture is that so many people don't know the distinction between joy and happiness. People are happy with God when he's got the blessing train coming by. Mm -hmm. People love the Lord when everybody getting blessed. You in line too, talking about my blessing coming to you. You know, God's going to prosper me and he's going to take care of me. You got to get to a place that even if you don't, God, I still trust you. And even if I'm afflicted, God, even if I never get it, even if I never have it, God, I know that you are my everything. Until God is enough, everything else. Until God is your everything, until God is enough, you will never be able to walk on the exploits. Because you've got to be filled to the brim. That, God, I'm not going to let anything keep my eyes off you because the moment you take your eyes off, off the light in him, your desire becomes diluted, and your desire becomes defiled. And when your desire becomes defiled and self-centered, your desire is now redirected away from God. And how many of us have journeyed away from God before? I tell people, boy, you may walk away from God. You may even run. But you'll never walk and run back to him. You always want to crawl back to him. I tell people, man, I've never walked back to God. And yo, God, what's up? Run back to God. <clears throat> no, 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 no. I came back. God, I'm crawling back to you. I never want to go back there. Because God said, good luck. You remember, uh, uh, what's that movie? Um, what's that movie? The dude was like, took his daughter, hey, take it. Um, and that dude said, good luck. I'm telling you, man, God, look at you like, good luck on that. Go out there and do what you got to do. Good luck on that, trying to do this without me. Let's talk about the process of fulfillment. You were created to be fulfilled. Fulfilled. Right now in my current state, that's why I told, I told God in my prayers when I said, man, I am so glad that I wake up every day knowing my purpose. 
Imagine the countless of people that wake up and do not even know why they're here. When I walk out in my life, I'm like, man, life may suck at moments. Life may be tough at moments, but I know the hope that's in me. I know my purpose. See, fulfillment begins with focus. Whatever you focus on flourishes. The problem in our culture is many people are focused on the wrong things, therefore the wrong things are flourishing. That since the Bible says, since the days are evil, he says, make the best use of the time. Many of us are so easily distracted, so easily wavering. When was the last time you locked in on something? We're not talking about locking in on 50 different things, locked in on one thing. Because you're trying to do multiple things at the same time, they all gonna suffer. So you gotta say, God, okay, from, from, from priority of the most degree, the top degree to the least degree. I will focus on what I got to get out. So what happened with pornography? This is a problem. We got this on the top of the list. I can't put that on the bottom of the list. I can't be like, there's, there's some things in your life you just can't get back to. Oh, I'm going to get to that. No, no, no. You can't procrastinate on heart issues. You got to put that thing on the top level of priority and say, I'm not going to leave this point until it's completely eradicated out of my life. That's focus. That God, while I'm fixed on you, show me me. And God, oh, you want to see you? <laughs> you want to see the good and bad, ugly of you? Here you go. And God said, put this on the top list of priority. Because if you, if you want to be a husband, Josh, you got to get rid of that lust. Right. If you want to be a husband, Josh, you got to understand how to balance. I mean, there's so much that comes with the next level. And many people are so caught up on the next level, but they forget to develop on this level. So what happens is many people just erase their single life. Oh, this, I'm tired of being single. They rush into marriage. You know? So what happens when they rush into it? They get rushed out. If you don't get time to say, you know what, God? What is dangerous in me right now? What is the foul in me right now? Because if I don't eradicate this out of my life right now, I won't be able to walk another step in your will. Because I'm telling people, man, God is not going to endorse a defiled person. Now, will he love you? Will he draw you? Will he keep you? But he won't put you on the platform to be his spokesman. When Tiger Woods got into this issue, Nike removed their endorsements. Johnny Manziel, when he got in problems in, in Cleveland, LeBron removed his endorsement, his agency. When you are in sin, God says, I can't endorse you no more. I can't just be miraculous. I'm not even talking about sin by default. I'm not talking about, like, oh, I mess up every now and then. We're talking about habitual sin. Habitual sin that says, I know this is wrong, but I don't care how God feels about it. I don't care about how you feel about it. I'm going to do me. God said, oh, you do you. I tell people, his will, he will. Your will, he won't. That's one of the most powerful words he gave me last. He said, Josh, my will, my will. My will, I will. But if it's yours, I can't help you, bro. Because when was the last time you became perfect and died on the tree? and die for humanity's sin? When was the last time you walked perfectly? When was the last time you could be me? <laughs> People call themselves God. <laughs> what world have you created? What? <laughs> what, what have you done in your own life? And People telling me I'm a God, and I'm like, man, you a God? Bro, go out there on your own, out of space, and create a world, and they come back to me, and I might believe you. But since you can't, <laughs> See, I don't care if you call yourself a guy, you a little G, bro. Like you, you based up with it. You fake G. You, you ain't G at all. Because I tell you, every person thinks they're God when they stand before the real OG. <laughs> when they stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, you can be a king if you want. You can be a Lord if you want, but all of us are going to be held accountable to the OG, the original God, the one who he who he is. That's why he says, Moses called, tell him that I am sent you. Why do you say tell him I am sent you? You say anything after I am, he's limited. If he says anything after, he says, I'm, just, I'm who I am. I, mean, I, can't, I can't put nothing else after I am because you will put me in that box. Come on, man. Mm -hmm. And until you can be unlimited, you might not close your mouth. Mm -hmm. And so all of us have to get to a place where we say like Jesus did, not my will, but thine will. Mm -hmm. God, those words are sweet fragrance to God who wants to do exploits to you. You get to a place where you say, God, not my will. But God, when's the last time you let your will go? It's, it's scary, y'all. It's scary to let you go with this ministry. It was about this time last year where Unplugged 
was supposed to die. After the Jackie Hill concert, after it was at McKnight Hall, <clears throat> some things transpired and my health was bad and I had to stop. It was around May, the beginning of May, when y'all heard the story while I was on 45, and I was like, man, I'm about to kill myself. I'm ready to go. Because how can I ever get back to where I was, cut? Middle days cut, we was at 24-7, man, and we was sitting on the chairs, right? And we were just chilling, just talking God's word. When I was driving home, God said, you was trying to do your will. Even back when I first started, I still tried to do my own will by trying to have the, the concerts and have the sound on stuff. He said, Josh, go back to 24-7 days. All you had was an open Bible. When I try to hold on to my own will for my life, it crumbled. I didn't want to go back to Campus 3 at Victor. I didn't want to go. That place had no air conditioning, no heat. We was over there sweating. I lost about 10 pounds preaching that Thursday. I said, God, I don't want to go back. I started calling the places. Where am I going to take your people? Where am I going to do this again? Stumbled into this place. Tell people, the moment you let your hands go, he will always continue to provide. And we're in the back room of a nice facility. Mm -hmm. But if it was my will, this thing would still be in shambles. Letting something that you had a part in birth and letting that go, you have a son. Imagine God saying, trust me. My mom used to always call. My mom used to always be scared I was the only child. And she said, I will always pray. She said, I will always be there. You'll be getting home at 12 o'clock. And I'm like, my couldn't come in at 4. <laughs> but she was like, you don't realize, this is back in the day, she said, you don't realize that I'm your mother. That until I know you're okay, I'm not okay. And she said, but God, because I was not in here, I wouldn't call back. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? My phone, I was I didn't know because I wasn't a parent. My phone died, and I showed her that like, is my baby okay? And she said, you know what? I had to realize that what I can't do, I have to trust him with. Mm -hmm. What you can't control, let your hands go. What you can't control, tell God, I trust you. Because when you try to handle what you can't hold, it will always fold in your life. Until you're able to say, you know what, God? For those who are like, man, I'm wrestling in my singleness, I'm wrestling in my marriage, I'm wrestling... The Bible says, do what you can, after that you stand. You stand and then you wait to see the salvation. But when your desires has been drifted from the light in the hand, your desires become defiled and self-centered. When your desires become defiled and self-centered, it becomes redirected. <clears throat> but when you know that you was created to feel fulfilled, that you shouldn't try to desire more money more opportunities, you should desire more of God. And when you desire more of Him, He'll take care of everything around you. He says, just focus on me and focus on improving, and the rest will fall into place. But when you focus too much on trying to do everything else, but focus, not focus on you, the part you miss will trip you up. There's things in your life you need to say, until this is eradicated, I would not move on. Does that mean you don't go to work? Does that mean you don't know? It's just said. I'm in light of this issue. So since I'm in light of this issue, day by day, week by week, until it's gone, I'm going to work on eradicating this out of my life. But if you don't focus on God and focus on improvement, you and your relationship with God will not flourish. And if you and God are not flourishing, you won't feel fulfilled. Let's keep going, man. That's only two points. Y'all all right? Y'all even good we eat? Number three, God desires for you to know his will. God desires for you to know. God is not sitting there like, man, I don't want you to know what I got for you, man. The Bible says in James, if any man lacks wisdom, he can ask me. I'm not going to withhold it from you. I remember when I was 17 years old, man, he should have never told me the story about Solomon. I was like, if Solomon had the audacity to ask God for wisdom, I'm going to ask for it. I used to always ask God, give me wisdom beyond my years, God. These people are smart, but they ain't wise. There's a difference between being book smart and being wise. And I said, God, read your books. He's smart. Don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is, there's something about having, there's no middleman. You got direct access. 
that God is like, oh, you ask? I got the answers for you. All you got to do is make sure you're close enough to hear me. Next plus says, his will would never be clear to a person who is not close. If you want the will of God to be clear, you have to be close to him. The enemy of being close to God and the enemy of clarity is clutter. If you want to be close to God and you want your connection with him to be clear, you have to declutter your space. There's two types of space in your life. Your internal space and your external space. Everyone has this awareness about people's personal space, unless you're a pedophile or a crazy person or a murderer, you know, people that ain't got the right line. There's space, and then there's my personal space. It is my responsibility to protect that gap. A lot of us are cluttered in our lives. There's things in your life that's keeping you from getting close to him, and there's different things that's keeping you from hearing from him clear. I tell people this. It's so sad that many of us are hoarders. We've been hoarding different things from every season of our life. How many of us are still hoarding on what he did to you, what she did to you? They used to hunt me. I'm over there. I'm like, why do I still got this in the closet? Why do I still got this in the back room? Why am I still holding on to something? I should have took the dumpster years ago. And the reason why God can't get you close to him, or God cannot speak to you, or you cannot know his will, is your mind cluttered. Your space cluttered. Your soul is cluttered. I want you to get this, I'm going to do this right here. Get, get, a, get a note card. And I want you to write down everything that you need to get rid of. Things that you need to declutter. I want you to write, if someone bring me a trash can, it's all about keeping that trash can. I want you to put it right on this table right here. There are things that we know for a fact. You don't got to show nobody. This is, this is just, it's, it, I'll write that for you. There are certain things you know for a fact that needs to be out of your life. You got to let him go. That man long gone, man. Yeah, she hurt you, man, but she gone, man. You on YouTube, I want you to get, I want you to get a sheet of paper. I want you to write down three to five things, six things, it could be 50. As you know for a fact, you got to get out of your life. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to write it down. Here's what you meant to me. See, when you have your fist ball in a fist, if you have your hand into a fist, God can't get nothing in there. But do you know how liberating this is? Everybody take a look. Stop for a minute. Do you know how liberating this is? Just the fact that you just let it go. What I want you to do is write those five to ten things down. And as I continue my message, I want you to just go ahead and dump it in this trash can. Whatever it is. Because it's something about an exercise like this that says, you know what? If I do not physically do this, if I don't do what I got to do to say, you know what? God, I want this out of my life. I know it's tough, man. Those tormenting thoughts that hunt you every day. Those persuasive thoughts that's like, you ain't amount to nothing. Because what we're going to do is that we're making room. We're making room for him. Because what hurts me the most is that God's like, I want it to come in. But there's no place for me to sit. Because your soul is so cluttered. Your mind is so clutter. How can my word minister to you? How can my word penetrate to you if your life is cluttered? God was going to read Mark chapter 4. Yeah, you can bring it up. And I want you to let it go of the church. Just let it go, man. This might be corny for folks, some folks. But this is liberating. I want you to come to this trash can and say, you know what? Right now, this is an outward expression, God, of me letting go of this. Because God, even though I'm throwing this in the trash can now, when I get home, I'm going to start the process of cleaning myself up. Throw it away. Let it go. I don't care if you got to cry. I don't care what you got to do. I don't want to cry. Not everybody watch. But what you need to know is this stuff has to go in order for you to make room for God.
God to come in. I know the pain. I know the hurt, man. For years, I used to have crazy thoughts in my mind that I'm inadequate if I don't have a degree. I'm inadequate if I don't have this, that I'm nothing. And God said, boy, who made your hand? Who made your lips? Who gave you the call? Man did not give you the call. I called you. And better yet, son, I chose you. And there's something different about them being called and being chosen. I used to be like, Mama, why can't I, why can't I leave God, Lord? Mama, I don't want to do this no more. My bro and my boys used to talk to me. I used to vent. I don't want to do this no more because it's tough, God. My mom used to say, boy, you're chosen. But if you're chosen, so we, Mark chapter 4. I don't know why God's leaving me here, but it's a powerful um, passage nonetheless. If you got your Bibles on in here, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter Mark chapter 4, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Y'all all right? It don't matter. You're not interrupting me if you ain't throwing anything away. You can throw it away at the end of the night. But before you leave here, I want you to ball that thing up in your hand. And I want you to tell God, I'm done with holding this. That I'm going to let this thing go. Again, he began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered about him. So that he got into a boat and sat in on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, Listen, behold, the sower went, to, out, went out to sow. And, he, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since it had no root, since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it and they yield no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing, and yielding thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let's go down to verse 13. And he said to them, because the, 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 the disciples are like, man, what you talking? Man, what you talking? And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy, and they have no root in themselves but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arise on account of the word, immediately they, de immediately they fall away. How many people do you know receive them with joy? And almost in the same breath, fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. There are those who hear the word. You hear it. You understand it. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word. And it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown in good, on good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit. Some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. The grounds represent our heart. When we have hard hearts, the word hits on the ground. And the devil said, oh, they don't have no soil, so let me come and take the seed. The soil that represents the shallow soil are people who receive it with joy, but they don't have enough fruit. The people with the thorns in their heart are people with care. That until I get my heart cultivated, until my heart is first pruned. Until, so that's what I tell people, the Holy Spirit always prepared the person's heart before the goodness draws them to repentance. Meaning that the heart has to be toiled. And until you say, God, remove the stones, remove the rocks, remove the thorns. Because God, when you plant seed into my life, I don't want to be bearing forth tenfold. I want thirtyfold, sixtyfold. A hundredfold return. What does that mean? If your heart is cluttered, how can you give anything back to him? If my heart is so filled with anything and everything else, how can I give back? How can I give love to my wife if there's lust there? How can I give love to people if I got ego and pride on how can I give if my heart is too full of all this other stuff? That's why I tell you now, man, I don't care about what they, I don't care about what they do. Don't get caught up on Instagram, because what they post is fake, ladies and gentlemen. How the stuff you see that you get upset with, that we, I get upset with folks, too. And they like, that's not even genuine. God said, man, don't worry about what they're doing. Focus on your heart. Because if you 
take the time that you need now to say, God, I'm going to work on my heart. There's some stuff in there, y'all. There's some stuff in me that'll make y'all be like, whoa, sir. <laughs> There's some stuff in you that if we bow the fly on the wall, and many of us have been bypassing it. And God said, my will for you is to repent and believe. Mm -hmm. My will for you is for you to rest in my saving word. My will for you right now. Before, before we get to your specific will, you got to know my general will. Let's keep going. There are two wills. God's general will and God's specific will. God's general will is for us to repent and believe. Or in other, in other words, repent and rest. Let's talk about that. I talked about this some last week, but I want to kind of hammer it down a little bit more. <clears throat> God's general will is, yo, man, look, I died, I rose. Here's my gospel. My gospel is not a fairy tale story. A gospel is not a novel. A gospel is when a king comes to another country, he said, this is the new order. We ain't talking about the new world. We talk about we, the world order was already started when he died. He said, right now, this is the new order. This is, my gospel means since I came, right? Since I lived a perfect life and died the right death and I rose, there's a new order. Now, if he didn't do it, then we'll keep going in our original order. But since he did live, since there was a Yeshua Christos that did live, since there was a man that Jewish historians and, and, and secular historians and people who didn't believe him said there was a man by that name who was crucified and that there was people who saw him raised from the not raised from death, but saw him ascended. There were 11 disciples that were murdered. If they were murdered for a fake story, I would have been the first one that I made up. If I know I was going to get guillotine, Israel, if I knew I was going to die, I would have like, hey, hey, Jesus died, yo. <laughs> I ain't trying to lose my life. Hey, hey, someone was crucified upside down. Someone was dipped in tar. Someone was thrown off a building for a made up story. And since he did live, and since he did die, and since he did rose and ascended to the right hand of the Father, and since when they was on the upper room and, and the Holy Spirit came, it's a new order. How you respond to that will determine your ultimate destination. <laughs> How you respond to that gospel will determine where you end up. That's why I don't want to respond to it because the order has been established. There's no council of people trying to try to kick his order out. They may take him out of school. They may take him out of the courthouse, but they can't take him away from heaven. And if his order is established, it is my responsibility to say, you know what? That's what I tell people. Don't just get emotionally connected to God. Don't just go in your churches and you got the on him, you're traveling for the word at the altar. Make sure you intellectually know what you believe. Four or five years ago, cut. Listen to my boys, Rod Zacharias and Tim Keller. And I began to dig deep into like, oh, this thing's legit. That it would take a trillion, it would be one out of a trillion for all these prophecies to match up into one man? Yo, if this thing is really true, I, mean, sure, I repent and believe. I'm sold. I'm not only sold by my intellectual understanding, I'm sold because I was a wretch undone. That I can't save you from myself. Can you save you? You can patch up, you can power your face, you can fix yourself up, but you can't fix you. And what happens is, we get so caught up on, do I really need Jesus or do I really not need him? That's why I say, don't take my, what was that, uh, uh, reading rainbow? He said, don't take my word for it. <laughs> what did he say? Y'all young too young? But anyway, what he was talking about, what I'm trying to say is, go look at it, look it up for yourself. I don't mess up that whole thing. What I'm trying to say is, don't take my word for it. Go research it for yourself. Yeah. But if this thing is true, then what is it required for me to do? And God's general will for you and for me is say, repent from your sin and rest in my saving will. That's a miracle. The Josh back in 2008 and the Josh today, I don't know how I got here, but I know it was a miracle. Am I close to perfection? Not even close. But I know because of his hand, his invisible hand in my life, I'm better than who I was. It was by grace that you are better than who you were. Because if you was left alone, you would have jacked up your life far worse. His general will is for you to repent and believe. Repent from your
your sin and say, God, I no longer am going to follow my way. Repentance, like I always tell people, because I like talking about this because it's powerful. Repentance is not saying I'm sorry. You heard me say it before, it's saying I'm done. When a person says I'm sorry, they just say, oh, my bad, I'm sorry, I'm actually no. so Repentance says, you know what, I'm, God, I no longer want to do this no more. Because I'm done with it. Many of us have been going to God with our prayers. It was, it's nice, it's okay, it's, it's been good prayer. God, I'm sorry, we'll fall right back to the same sin next day. I'm sorry. The next day. When you, see, when I hurt somebody I love, the level of my love for them determines my level of remorse. If I hurt someone that I love, the remorse is heavy. But if I barely even love him, then my remorse for God is weak. That's why I say your respect for someone limits your actions. I respect women. I have never hit a woman in my life. And I never will hit a woman in my life. Because of my respect for women. So my respect for women limits my physical action. It doesn't matter what happens, I can't put them paws on. Right? Because I know for a fact that I have too much respect for women, and I'm 265 pounds, right? I, I can't hurt a woman. But if I respect God, that's why the Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Not the mid or the end, the beginning. That when I respect him and I fear him and I reverence him, my actions now become limited. Because sin separates. Oh man, I know how it feels to be separated. I know how it is to preach without God endorsing me. <laughs> I know the feeling when I preach and I, don't, I know it's me talking and the Holy Ghost talk. I know that feeling. My greatest fear is not heights. Well, I'm afraid of uh, cost, I'm, I'm cost, I don't like being claustrophobic. That's another, that's another talk another time. <laughs> but what I'm talking about, the ultimate thing that I'm afraid of is hurting God. Because he's been too good. That's why the Bible says it's the goodness that draws you to repentance. That because you were good to me, I'm still going to fall in my sins. So when you hurt God and you respect over time, your actions become limited. Then not only are you repenting, you're not going to be repenting every day of the same matter. You're going to now be rediscovering other areas you need to repent from. Other areas you need to repent from. Because the more of God you get into, the lighter spreads wider in your heart. And you get, oh, snap. I didn't know that was in me. That's what I'm telling you right now. Stay before the light as long as you can. Let him expose you now. I'd rather be exposed privately. So I, you might want to go ahead and go to God and say, God, expose me now. <laughs> because God, I'll tell you, sin will creep up and bite you again. Sin is like weed. No, 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 no. weeds. Not weed. <laughs> weeds. <laughs> if you don't cut the weeds by the root, it'll grow back up again. Let's go to the next point. <laughs> Let's skip the next one. Um, we got time. I'm going to keep going. We good? Um, give me about five or ten more minutes. Let's talk about God's specific will. I'm gonna have to do another part. I need to get past this. <clears throat> I'm gonna get to. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this again next week, maybe two more weeks. His general will is also for us to love Him with all of our hearts, soul, strength, and mind, and also to love our neighbors as ourselves. His general will is also for, is for us to make sure that we love Him with all of ourselves, and that's not easy. That's it's not easy loving God with all of you. What was that? What was that? All of me loves all of you. What was that, John Legend? You got to get to a place where you say, all of me loves all of you. You got to be so in love with God that you got to be like, don't they leave, don't they forsake me. Don't they may leave. Even though I may go through anything, God, I'm not going to leave you. Amen. How committed are you to God? <laughs> People's commitment to God is very shallow. That's why God, that's why the wilderness always come for the promise. Like, you know why? Because the wilderness proves who's going to make it to it. The Bible says, they that endure to the end shall be saved. The Bible talks about even though they start with you, the proof that they're not with you is because when you get somewhere, they're not going to be with you. Many, you don't judge a person by how they start the race. You judge a person by how they finish the race. I may trip up and skip my knee, but if I get back up and I, I can still, even though I may start off wrong, I still can finish right. And so many people 
see these Christians go by us every day. And we're sitting there saying, didn't they start off well? But I tell these people, when you get to that level three of Christianity, <laughs> when you get to that level two and a half, <laughs> level one, you all happy. Level one, you're like, oh, I'm say. Now, Lord, my Bugatti is coming, Lord. <laughs> my mansion, Lord, everything. Oh, God. I want the red and black Bugatti, God. I want that 2018, God. It ain't made them yet, but I believe in you, Father. That you can get level one that still feels real good. But level two? Level two, when he starts removing stuff? Level two, God? God be like, oh, welcome to level two. By the way, I'm removing all your idols right now.
Because if you have a relationship with him now, you don't got to worry about death. Because death has lost its thing. The grave has lost its power. If I know for a fact my creator's going to meet me on the other side, shoot. That's what I told myself. If I get caught up in a train, it's a concentration camp. I know it's getting too, too detested. It's getting messed up. I told I told Mr. Cracker Jones in the home, but I said, you know what? I'm going to be like, I ain't going to die in a gas chamber, yo. I ain't going to be, I ain't going to be suffocating. I ain't, ain't going to go out there. I ain't going to take no guilty. I'm going to be the softest soldier in a bunch of them. I'm going to talk so much junk into you, shoot me in the face. Because I'm like, get me out of here quick. Because I, I know it's too deep. What I'm trying to say is, that is what I'm trying to say is, you see where I'm going with this? Because I'm like, look, man, God, I know for a fact what your word says. He says, do not fear man who can only kill the body. He says, you better fear the one who know who has a hell to put your soul in. They got a prison for me, but they don't got a hell for me. But do I go to God because of hell? No, I come to him because I need hope. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But I have a hope for you right now. And a man, Jesus, who says, you know, when I died a death that she was supposed to die, I lived a life that she was supposed to, so that you can have a hope and trust in me. He says, you was a joy that was set before me. Therefore, I endured the cross, so that I can be a joy set before you, so you can endure this life. And I tell people right now, until you repent and say, God, I'm going to accept your new order. I'm going to accept your gospel, and I'm going to trust and rest in you. I'm going to focus on you, and I'm going to focus on my mess. I'm going to work on me. I'm going to focus on my craft. So all of what I'm doing will flourish. Because, God, because of your gift you deposited in me, I want to make sure through my music, through my message, not my, not my music, but your music, I'm going to rap now, but through your gifts and through my gifts, he gets the best glory. I don't want to go to God with my basket with one fruit in it. Do you know how that was something before God had a basket with a couple of oranges and an apple? And homeboy beside you got pears and Pineapples and his basket's on the floor. He asked me to help him with his basket. I want to make sure that God gets the ultimate return for my life. My now is kind of off today. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, make sure that your basket is full. Occupy the time. Get busy because he lived. Since he gave you hope, since the days of evil, be productive. It's the difference between being busy and being productive. Being busy says, I'm just going to fill up this extra time with nonsense or other stuff. Productivity says, I have one common goal, one common mind, and I'm going to focus on this, and I'm going to be productive. Is your life flourishing? Are you on the path of fulfillment or on the path of defilement? Have you accepted God's original order when he says, repent and believe? Are you resting in his saving? Are you resting in him? Whatever in your life you can't control, let him take care of it. Because worrying is offensive to a God to do anything. Do not worry. And I tell people, the best way to be faithful is to realize how faithful he was to you. When I get frustrated with my current, my present life and my future, when I get nervous, God said, take a look back down memory road. Have I not brought you out of that? Did I not bring you out of this? Remember when you didn't have nothing? I brought you out of that? Remember that? He says, in order for you to remain faithful to me, look back and see how faithful I was to you. And since I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever, you don't have to worry about will I be faithful. I will be faithful. His will, he will. Your will, he won't. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for who you are. <clears throat> God, I didn't get all the way through my notes, but God, I think I said everything that you wanted me to say. I pray, Father God, as we chart through understanding your will and your specific will, I pray, God, that you begin to elaborate more throughout the weeks of how can we tap into that. And Father God, as we transition to our exercise, I pray, God, that if there's any questions or anything that these great people may have, I'll be able to answer them. As we have a discussion, God, I pray, Lord, that you continue to roam the room and, and be able to help us understand Mark chapter 4 and Romans chapter 12 a little bit more. With that being said, God, I love you. And I thank you for drawing me to repentance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Before we separate into groups, we'll read this one scripture. Psalms 143.10. Teach, teach me to do your will. For you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. That's power. Teach me to do your will. God, teach me. Until you go to God and say, God, not my will, but thine will. But don't stop at thine will. Say, God, teach me your will. He wants to be a teacher. He wants to make sure that you're a stronger woman. A stronger man. He wants to make sure that you can't. He said, I'll teach you how to be a husband. I'll teach you how to be a wife. 
Do not read all these different books. Do not read all these different opinions. He says, man, just as, just as realistic it is learning these principles from a book is just as realistic as you learning this from me. But we'll carve out so much time for everybody else to teach us than to say, God, I'm going to be still. And I believe that I receive instruction from you. That's why I tell people, when you go to God, go to God saying, thank you, make. You don't feel like believing, say, God, I believe that I receive from you. If you say that over and over again, you will actually believe. And I'm telling you, God speaks to me regularly, not like audibly, not like that. I ain't weird like that, right? You know, people that be talking about think God speaks to them all the time. But if God spoke to you that many times, why are you still the same man? But that, that's none of my business. I sit my teeth and I'm left. But what, I'm trying to say is, but what I am trying to say is that I know he's, he walks with me. I know he's with me. Does he speak audibly all the time? He'll speak through a commercial. He'll speak through a friend. He'll speak through a billboard. He's always speaking. The question is, are we always listening? Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. See how powerful it is? You gotta say, God, you are my God. Right. Confident. That means I'm confident that we good. I'm confident that I have access. For you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. He ain't trying to take you up no hills. He ain't trying to rush you to no valleys. He says, lead me on level ground. If you walk with God, it's a steady walk. It's a steady journey. Will it be hot? Will it be cold? Yes, but that level ground of being, he'll keep you sound, he'll keep you sane, he'll keep you balanced, he'll keep you level. But we're going to get into our groups. Since I didn't get through all my notes, man, I can't keep the exercise I'm going to go over today. But what we can do is talk about how, what can we do today? Um, Discuss in your groups, why do you feel people are cluttered? You can talk about what are things that keep people cluttered, what are some things that clutters people, and how can we declutter our lives? What are some sound principles that we can do to declutter our lives? I think, this was, I think that was the main message of tonight, was clutter. So I want you to get in your groups, talk about 10 minutes, and talk about how do I declutter my life, and what are some things that clutter people's lives? Have a discussion, talk about it, and we'll be back in 10 minutes. Does that make sense to everybody? So talk about the things that clutter people's lives, and talk about how can we clutter our lives, and we'll have a discussion in about 10 minutes.